Okay, let's go ahead and begin what will be our final lecture of the semester. Just a reminder, next week we will be taking the second of our two uh, exams. I'll be passing the study guide out for that a little bit later in class. I'll also be uh, providing uh, Professor Shapiro with a copy that she can uh, post online for her section, and I'll be posting it on uh, Moodle for our section as well, in addition to giving you the hard copy today. And then uh, week after that, Thanksgiving break, and when we come back, we will begin uh, presentations that hopefully everybody is working on now, their group presentations. Um, Professor Shapiro and myself will be uh, collaborating to come up with a order of when people will be, be presenting during those uh, final two weeks of the semester. So today we're going to uh, try to uh, tie up some loose ends of things that we've been talking about all semester. A lot of what we've discussed has revolved around that uh, simplified model of the social world that we introduced the first couple weeks of the semester. The, the, the concept that we all live in the social world. There are various aspects of media and media audience surrounding that, and that the influence goes in multiple directions. So um, I think that we're going to look a little bit, first of all, at how uh, media technology, changing media technology, can be an agent for social change, and how much that is actually true. Uh, I, I think, for instance, uh, and I, I, again, I watch way too much of political news, but um, watching the last couple days, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, so-called pundits scratching their heads trying to figure out election results this week because that's not what all the traditional models said was supposed to happen. But something very different did happen than what everybody was predicting. And I have to wonder, for instance, does our changing media landscape uh, play into that? And I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to think about that at all, but if you haven't, it's something worth thinking about because, again, there are lots of influences. Every time we see any kind of seismic shift, whether it be in politics or any other area of society, and trying to figure out, well, what caused it? What were the things that caused it? And, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, down the road you, you hear more and more discussion about media of today, how it played a role, not just, I'm not just talking about mainstream media, but the fact that we have multiple media sources for information, some reliable, some not reliable, but uh, the choice can be very individualized, uh, almost like going into a smorgasbord in terms of the choices you have and say, I'll have a little of that, a little of that, as opposed to previous eras where you were given two or three choices and that's what everybody had. So does that factor into uh, not only changes we're seeing, but maybe failure for people to communicate and understand one another. That's, that's a, a great example of what we're talking about. Now, for a new technology to really have a profound impact, though, on our society and to change things, a couple things are really important. And some of you are probably already very well aware of at least one of these things. Let's say a new type of phone comes out or some new entertainment device that you really want. What is the first thing you're going to look at? You know, you're going to look at many things, hopefully, but what's the first thing you're going to look at in terms of, gee, am I going to get one of those? Price. Price, exactly. <laughs> Affordability. Uh, and if you follow new technology over the past uh, a decade or so, you've noticed that every time something new product comes out, whether it's an iPhone, whether it's a you know, flat screen, high definition television, <laughs> When they first show up in the market, a lot of times it's wildly expensive. And then as more and more people get into it past the early adopters, suddenly you start seeing the prices come down and down. And, and today I could buy um, a 60-inch television, for instance, for probably about half of what I spent for a 40-inch television 10 years ago. This is how changing technology and acceptance of that technology affects the pricing. So that's obviously a big factor. The other thing is, if you have new technology, you want it to be easy to use, right? If, it, if it's complicated, you're not interested. Most people are not interested. So affordability and ease of use are two key things for any new media technology uh, to really take hold. And, and it's kind of interesting when you think about it on a side note that 
to, to, when we, we use this fantastic technology that much of which didn't even exist 20 years ago, yet we may not necessarily understand how to use it. I have, still have a, a son in high school who's just amazing with technology, but if you asked him how it, how it works, I bet you he couldn't even tell you. He sure knows how to use it though. And, that, and that's what I'm talking about is, is uh, we, we have gotten very adept at using technology even though we don't necessarily understand the technology that makes it uh, possible. Um, and it's also interesting, too, to think the changes, uh, yeah? Sorry, I'm going to drop super quick. Um, okay, I'm yeah. I'm passing on roll. Um, please make sure to sign in. And also, last time Nikki wasn't here, one of you guys, like, stole the sheet. So please don't do that. And, like, make sure it's up here at the end. Okay, thanks. Oh, it's okay. All right, so when we talk about seismic shifts in terms of media technology, I think a great way to look at it is it just in terms of the kind of world I lived in when I was in college versus the kind of world you live in, in terms of accessing media entertainment, in terms of accessing information. So for instance, my world, my college world, consisted of television, radio, and newspapers. There, there were still no uh, DVDs or VCRs or any of that. Those, that was it. Those were the three things. Television, radio, and newspapers. And if you look at that even a little closer, what you notice is they provide different things for your different needs. For instance, what am I going to get from newspapers that I don't get from the other two? What, what is specifically unique to newspapers that's not unique to television or radio? What, what would that be? Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> it's printed word and you need it instead of it being like flashed out on the screen or mm -hmm. auditory. Yeah, it's printed, it's, it's often more in depth. Uh, you, you, uh, Traditionally, you're, you're probably going to get more detailed information about a particular story or a particular <coughs> subject from that uh, to, to kind of help your understanding. What's radio, what can radio give me that I wouldn't necessarily get from the other two sources? And we're, again, we're talking about the old media world that I used to live in. What, what would radio give me that's unique to radio? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly how I used it. Uh, you know, a lot of times in a very passive way, put music on in the background, can listen to music. I could, I could learn what new music was out there by playing the radio. It also um, could be, uh, in, in a lot of ways, the most immediate of the news mediums in terms of getting you breaking news because. Uh, radio needed much less technology to move around to, you know, basically you could send a reporter to the scene of something and all they have to do to get on the air is get on the telephone uh, as opposed to setting up a live truck and making sure you can get a signal and all those kind of things. So in terms of immediacy, you could often get uh, the most breaking current information from radio as well. Television. What did television provide that was so unique? What's, yeah. Yeah, visuals, yeah, absolutely. And we've talked about that this semester, haven't we? The fact that everything we look at um, has a, as a different uh, set of information for you, for your interpretation. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that today in terms of a concept called the, the medium is the message. And so, uh, you look at television and you get a visual image. I used the example earlier this semester that if you only read about 9-11 versus actually watching it on television, uh, how you process that tragedy is going to be different. It's not saying it wouldn't be a tragedy in both cases, but there's more of a visceral reaction to, to seeing the images and, and all, the, all the horrific things that were going on. So that's television. Also, another a great example, and I think we mentioned this in here, but the uh, JFK funeral, which was really the first time that an entire country, and I would argue the entire world, gathered around a television 
uh, to see a major news event play out. And, and in that case, uh, that's what people still talk about who were alive then. They talk about the visual images, what they remember seeing on television. They don't say, oh, well, I remember reading all about that in the paper. They talk about what they saw. So it can be a very uh, impactful thing. Now let's move forward to this era. And how has the internet disrupted those traditional roles that we just talked about for things like radio, television, and newspapers? This is all three. Exactly, it's all three. You can get everything you want there. So it's a major disruption. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a convenience for people to use it, but if you are in one of those mediums, it, it basically upended your medium because it, it upset everything from where you get your viewers or your readers to how you make money. And, and they're still trying to figure out the how you make money part of that equation uh, because there is no easy answer to that question, especially on something where so much of what you get on the internet is free of charge. It's really difficult to convince people that, you know what, you should still pay for your internet <coughs> subscription to news because people have this tendency to like free things and if they figure they, there's a way they can circumvent that to get information, and, and I do the same thing. Uh, I, I read papers where they have a certain block after 10 articles and I know how to get around those blocks. You know, it's just all a matter of how you use your search engine and what have you. So um, this is one of the problems facing uh, technology, uh, facing me media and technology today. So. What I want you to do now is I want you to take a look at these three questions that I've written on the board, uh, kind, of, kind of capstone questions for all the things that we've been talking about this semester. Uh, question number one, how does media technology influence A, social interactions, your social interactions from day to day, and B, your view of the world? Okay. I think you can probably pretty easily answer part A of that question, most of you. Part B, though, might require a bit more thought. How is your view of the world possibly molded and um, changed in some ways based on your use of media technology that exists today? Second question. At one time, rock music through media helped create and fuel a youth culture. Okay, by youth culture, what I'm talking about here, uh, the 1960s. The, you, you go back many decades, people didn't talk about youth culture. It wasn't a thing. But the rise of media and the rise of affordable media, remember there's that word again, affordable, like kids could go out and buy these 45 records, and suddenly a, a medium was created to create music they wanted to listen to. It evolved through the 60s, through other mass media forms, into this youth culture that led to demonstrations against society, to, against uh, things like the war in Vietnam, uh, the psychedelic era, drug experimentation, all these things that we encompass 60s and early 70s youth culture, uh, media played a big role in, and specifically uh, music. Uh, through mass media. So the question here in this, is today's media a unifying force for young people? Yes or no? Do you think it is? And then, and then answer why you think that is. And then finally the third question, how has your perception of media changed this semester? In other words, what were your thoughts about media coming in? How has that changed in maybe subtle ways or maybe significant ways over the course of this semester? I would argue that a lot of us, as, as saturated by media as we are, probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about how that media affects our lives and influences our lives. We've been doing that this semester. So how has your perception of media changed this semester? So take a few minutes, jot down some of your thoughts on that, and then I'll have you uh, share your answers in smaller groups. Okay, so question number one. How does media technology influence A, your social interactions, and B, your view of the world? What were some of the answers you came up with for that one? Your social interactions and your, your view of the world. Yeah. Um, you said there's a lot less like, face to face interaction, so there's a lot of interaction online. Uh huh. Yeah, and I would imagine that's a pretty common answer, right? There's um, a lot less face-to-face -face interaction. 
How, how would you, and I know this is just a rough guess, but I'm just curious how some of you would sum up the breakdown in terms of communication with your friends, in terms of face-to-face -face versus uh, through your mobile device, so to speak. You know, what, what, how, would, how would you break that down if you were just gonna give a rough guess? You know, 30, 70, 40, 60, 50, 50, what would you, what, 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 give me some percentages. Just in general, you can include all your friends in it. You know, the ones you go to school with and the ones you don't. You know, there's people that you consider friends. How much how much of your time is spent face to face? How much of your time is spent uh, on a device? I don't know, maybe 60 40. 60 40. Anybody else have a different number, 60 40? I'm just curious. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 30 70. 30 70. Okay. Anybody else higher or lower than that? That sound about right? Does that fit what most people would describe themselves at? It's pretty significant when you think about it. I mean, when you particularly think about how it might have been, say, for your parents, your people my age, in terms of you might have spent a few times on the phone. Most of the time you were on the phone, it was because A, it was your only option, or B, you were just trying to set up some plans. But I would say that the percentage breakdown was probably much more heavily weighted toward uh, a personal interaction then. Okay, so let's go to the second part of your question, this question, which is something that, you know, I said required maybe a little bit more thought. How does media technology influence your view of the world? What were some of the answers we had for that? Yeah, yeah. What I think is interesting is like with social, social media and like Twitter, um, I think a lot more users, um, at least in America, are aware of what's going on here. Um, because of what's being retweeted or spread around and a lot less of what's going on in other countries. Mm -hmm. I think it's definitely like evident that you can seek that information for yourself mm -hmm. um, and that is successful in that way, but it's not what's being spread around. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting observation about Twitter. Yeah, what, what else, yeah? I think it's like, why do you have more accessibility like these different opinions and things like that, but it also gives a really limited view on things mm -hmm. because Yeah, the, I think the expression I used for that early in the, earlier in the semester was uh, uh, saying that the internet is kind of like a river that's a mile wide and an inch deep. You So much information that you hear about many different things hitting you from all sides, but yeah, how much do you really get in terms of detailed information? So that's a really excellent point too. So to sum up your answer, your worldview may be broader but l less detailed. Okay, I know, I know there was a revolution here, and I know they had an election here, but I can't really tell you much more than that, that kind of thing. What else? What else would you say about how media technology influences your view of the world? I'm sure we have more than two or three different answers, yeah. I feel like I see a lot more negative posts than mm -hmm. I do positive, and it's kind of like hard because you think that the whole world is just filled with mm -hmm. bad That's events. That's a good point too, and it kind of almost ties into uh, social interactions a little bit too. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of complaining in a lot of corners that the internet, particularly for people's ability to comment anonymously on the internet in various forms, has made our world a less civil place. A lot more mean-spiritedness uh, out there. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? How do you feel in terms of the things you read and see on the internet? Yeah. I think people are attracted to more negative news. I feel like that's mm -hmm. why it's like embedded in news stories and mm -hmm. newscasts because people kind of tune into that more than positive news. Mm -hmm. so I think that's yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah, neg negativity ha has a certain amount of uh, motivating in terms of uh, people's interest. But yeah, go ahead. Um, I feel like people use media to put their opinions <coughs> on something because they're afraid to do it like in person. Like mm -hmm. they don't want to show that side of them. So yeah. it's a good way for them to do it um, like passive aggressively. Yeah. Or aggressive aggressive. aggressively, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just there's some really some really cruel things on there, and typically they're they don't have a name attached to them. Yeah. But it's hard to differentiate like the truth and the, like. People kind of hype up 
certain stuff, so you can't really tell. Like, I noticed I can't tell what's right and what's, like, what's truthful. Mm -hmm. People kind of put two versions of themselves. Yeah. You know, they put one on the internet and then who they actually are. So you can't really tell who. Yeah, there are. Yeah, and, and this kind of also, just in general, is a really important answer, too. The fact that what to believe. You know, when we talk about our view of the world, right? And we also talk about some surveys and studies that suggest that more than half of all millennials get a lot of their news from social media, okay? Do we have the potential there to have our worldviews be inaccurate? to maybe not be complete. That's, that's a huge thing to think about. Are we, and this is also important in a democratic society, are we armed with the right information? Are we armed with the correct facts? And sometimes we think we are and we're not. Um, this is, this is a, uh, you know, something we have to think about in terms of what we're reading. Where are we seeing this information from? Is what we're hearing and seeing true or not? So I think I would argue that in terms of uh, your view of the world, that media technology has incredible, um, it, and it's ironic, it has the ability to do both. It has the ability to make you more informed because you have access to so much more information. But again, as studies are suggesting, it also has the ability to make us less informed. And, and that's uh, something that can be uh, very frightening in a democratic society. Okay. Number two, at one time rock music through media helped create and fuel a youth culture. Is today's media a unifying force? Um, and, and when I talk about youth culture too, it's, it's also, I think, helpful to kind of elaborate. You know, many of you have probably heard about this from your parents or you read about it in a history class, but it, it's pretty dramatic what happened with the help of media in terms of youth movements uh, of the 60s and 70s. And, and for instance, look at, look at teenagers circa, say, 1955. Uh, look at the average teenage male in 1965. What are you going to see in pictures of that era? What typically will you see? Can anybody kind of get a visual of what that might look like? Say a group of, of, of teenage males in, in the 1955, what they might look like. What do you think? First of all, probably very conservatively dressed, right? Probably a you know, nice to, to button shirt, uh, a crew cut, some kind of very, uh, very conservative style haircut. And this was pretty much the norm for everybody. Look, again, look at, um, and this, this would be going back to your grandparents. Look at if your grandparents have any yearbooks around. Open them up, flip through the pictures, and tell me what you see. Tell me all the, all the, how the haircuts look, how everybody is dressed in those pictures. Now you move the needle from 55 to 1969. That's the summer uh, Woodstock happened. Okay, you've ever seen footage of Woodstock? How, how did teenagers look then? Radically different, radically different. To think about that. Have you seen that kind of visual change in young people, say from, if this is a 2016, from 2001 to 2016, can you say any, the changes in how we dress and look is that dramatically different in the past 16 years, 15 years? Yeah, it's <laughs> just subtle changes, but very similar. But you look at that, it, it's a complete sea change. And the reason was they, they had music, they had their own media and they formed their own opinions and they rejected everything, well not everything, but a lot of what their parents' generation were believing in and started playing by their own rules. And they could not have done that without media. So that's an important perspective to have when we talk about question two. So is today's media a unifying force for young people? I've had people argue this both ways. Some people said, yeah, it is. Other people said, no, it's, it's actually more divisive or, or breaks us, you know, fragments us somewhat. So I want to hear what your thoughts are in this discussion as, as this generation. What do you think about media and does it unify you as a generation or does it divide you? What, what are some of the things you came up with on that question? Yeah. I think it unifies you because each generation kind of has their own um, <coughs> Like if you think of teens in like the early thousands, you think of like the Motorola flip phones. Now you're thinking of us, and we're like the first generation to be completely raised mm -hmm. 
front with iPhones and computers. Mm -hmm. And I think it depends on your definition of unifying. If you think mm -hmm. unifying as like face to face interaction, then no. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking it of it in a way where we're all together in one place, that's social media. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Anybody else? What do you think? How has uh, today's media affected you in terms of is it a unifying force? Yeah. I think it has the potential to be a unifying force, but I think that <clears throat> the way that our generation, like millennials and mm -hmm. stuff, we are, what from what I've seen, very stubborn in our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And whenever we see something that doesn't necessarily cater to our beliefs, we just don't want to hear about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people have, like you were saying earlier, it's a platform for people to mm -hmm. uh, express their opinions. Mm -hmm. So if somebody sees opinions that they don't necessarily like to kind of shun yeah. that information, and there's a lot of people that have different opinions. So I think that it's divisive in the sense that we just don't want to hear what a lot of other people have to say, yeah. even if it might be like valid. So it's possible what you're saying, millennials are doing the same thing older generations are doing, which is they are seeking out the media that supports their already existing worldview and, and kind of fluffs it up as opposed to challenging it. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a something that's a common issue among all generations right now. That's certainly part of it. Um, the other part of your question that I think is interesting about the potential, and I think we've referenced this in class too, the fact that uh, in what happened at the Arab Spring a few years ago, and that uh, people use media platforms like Twitter to help fuel and unify during a revolution in several different countries uh, where they would not have been able to do that if, if they only had traditional media sources, old media sources to depend on. So in that sense, in a very important way in their world, it was definitely uh, a unifying force. Okay, number three, how has your perception of media changed this semester? And this could be an interesting question because, like I say, some of you may have already explored some of these issues and thought about them. Some of you really maybe have not. And maybe so changing perception for you is just thinking about it at all and thinking about specific things. For other people, maybe you had this view of the media's role in your world and now it's slightly changed. What, what, what are some of the perception changes you've experienced this semester? from August to November, yes. Well, I think, like, I can say a lot about, like, what I've learned in the class, but, like, as for events that have taken place, mm -hmm. I think beyond, like, confirmation bias that's been, like, outlined in our discussion today, mm -hmm. um, I think seeing things, like, from CSUs and UCs in the past couple days, like, with the, um, the protests that are going on, I think it's really interesting to see how it, um, it unifies, like, a certain demographic mm -hmm. from, you know, an entire state, and people do feel like, you know, a greater sense of unification. Mm -hmm. I think that that aspect is really eye-opening that has that. <coughs> That's actually a really good uh, thing to think about for a second. Uh, the, uh, all the protests that sprung up in major cities uh, across the country in the last day or two. Uh, and I would argue that a good reason that they sprung up in so many different places was through media platforms. So I think a lot of it started with that hashtag not my president, hashtag not my president. And it, it, it blossomed into all <coughs> these spontaneous demonstrations in these major cities. You know, my question is, if you did not have social media platforms, would we have seen as many protests? I would still argue you would probably see some protests, but would it have been so across the board? That's a good question to think about. I think it's the, it like, speaks to the importance of like a visual stimulus to have their effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seeing the videos that people take. Yeah. So. Yeah. Does anybody else have uh, some answers to this? Because uh, there's a lot, a lot of different ways we can look at this. How has your perception of media changed this semester? It can be a small way. It can be a large way. Who wants to go? On? Yeah. Um, I think I just said the agenda setting. Like, the what? The agenda setting activity. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the concept of agenda setting, that's actually, that's a good answer too, because I've had people tell me that in the past, that, you know, yeah, I never really thought about it, 
but somebody's got to decide what's news and what if they're not making the right choices or the choices I would make. Uh, what does that mean in terms of our worldview as we were just talking about a, a moment ago? So that's, that's a really good thing to think about. The people who are working in the media, the decisions they make, how they affect your level of information and your understanding of the world. Uh, what else? How, what other ways has your perception of media changed this semester? Yeah. Um, I think about like in the beginning when you were talking about like um, how like Facebook and like all this stuff have like news articles, but then they're like not really like true. They're just really biased. So like every time I'm on Facebook or like Twitter and I see like like oh so and so did this or like this is why we shouldn't like do this, and I read it and I'm just like I don't know if I should like believe it or not. Mm -hmm. like, take it as news because it's just like that could be like yeah. Well, and these kind of stories, too, have uh, created a kind of a cottage industry of fact-checking organizations, online, uh, out, you know, like uh, PolitiFact and other online uh, fact-checking op operations so that you, when you see some story like that, you go, is that true? And I've done that before, something I haven't even heard before, so I, I'll type in the key phrase of, of one of these websites, and I'd say nine times out of ten, it's completely not true nine times out of ten. Occasionally I see something that is true, but it's amazing how much false story, uh, false stories are perpetuated through social media. Um, what else? Per ways your, your, your perception of media even changed? I want to see if we have not to ch touched on or anybody's touched on things or that we haven't discussed yet here in class. Yeah. Um, I used to think that it was like destroying human relationships, like personal mm -hmm. relationships, but then at the same time, I think now, it's it's not so much destroying it, but it's kind of like allowing you to see, I don't know how to phrase it, but like you're seeing people in a different light. A different kind of relationship, redefining, yeah. maybe not destroying, but you're saying maybe it's redefining. Yeah. Okay, that's, a, that's a, a, a great answer to explore a little bit more <coughs> deeply, because this comes up a lot. Uh, this is something that particularly you might hear, again, from your parents who are, who, are, who are so irritated that you're constantly texting your friends or whatever, and they say, you know what, why can't people talk anymore? These phones are destroying relationships. I bet you at least a few of you have heard that somewhere in your family at one time or another. Do you think that's true, or do you think it is just a question of redefining those relationships, those personal relationships? Damaging or redefining? What do you think? Because you all use you all use social media to maintain relationships. Do you do you think it's damaging in any way? I think whether you want it to change or not, it's going to change. Because I've noticed media is completely unavoidable now. Even if I like put my phone away and don't look at anything, mm -hmm. even if I'm just like, walking down the street, I'll see like a billboard mm -hmm. or like a newspaper on the floor. So you can't not see yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it's getting more and more sophisticated all the time. They're developing, and they may already be out there, but uh, they're developing uh, things that, for instance, if you are, um, you know, the algorithms that if, uh, that if you go to something that, you know, they automatically now can start texting you on your phone, you know, that, oh, so-and-so is having a concert, tickets are on sale. Maybe you didn't, weren't looking for that concert, but they, they figured out that that's in your interest range or something. You know, they're developing these kind of things to just really hit you from all directions and, and, and uh, tug for your attention. So that, that's something to think about. Quick bonus question. What is your favorite thing about living in the media era you currently live in and what's your least favorite thing? A couple of you already talked about this, how you, how, how we, live in an era that you were born into this era that your parents were not born into. You're the first generation to grow up in this technological era. So what's your uh, most favorite, least favorite? You were first. No? Change your mind? Yeah. I was going to say my favorite thing is that it gives people a platform. Mm -hmm. My least favorite thing is that it gives people a platform. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about that, haven't we? Yeah. And, and I, n never in the media history of my lifetime over the past century has there been a more democratic platform than the Internet. 
Absolutely. And with dem democracy comes some imperfections. Absolutely. We all have a voice. Sometimes you just assume not hear some of those voices. But ultimately, I would argue, yeah, that's a good thing, that people have a chance to be heard and express their uh, opinions on a media platform. What else would you, would you say is a favorite thing or a, a least favorite? Um, yeah. A favorite thing would be like the platform that you said, but uh, least favorite would be that like, people are so attached to it, they don't like to put their phones down, especially like, mm -hmm. when someone is talking to them, they're not like live and engaged with like, a, mm -hmm. an actual uh, interaction with someone. Yeah. Yeah, and this is something uh, that we all struggle with, and uh, your generation more than others, but it's a factor in my generation. Uh, I, I, again, I think I've mentioned this, it's, it's a source of irritation between my spouse and myself because she has totally embraced the smartphone era, and I haven't. So there are times I feel like having a conversation and she's busy getting a text and she's, she's answering or she's FaceTiming or she's doing something. So. Uh, uh, I will get irritated, yeah. And she gets irritated that I never answer my phone. So it works both ways. Uh, okay, and other favorite things, other least favorite things, yeah. My least favorite thing is having like dependency on it. Mm -hmm. I can't like, go a day without getting at my phone. But my favorite thing is my access to anything and everything that's like the touch of a button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Is anybody ever been in a situation where like, you have to get on a Has anybody ever been in a situation, because I know some classes do this, uh, where you say, uh, okay, we're not going to uh, interact with media as much as we can help it for X number of hours or X number of days. Have, have any of you done this? Yeah. I, guess, I see several people shaking your head. Did you do it in your section? Okay. How did that go? <coughs> it was hard. It was hard? <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to do it? Or did, or did people use, basically flame out before the period? Yeah. <coughs> So that's interesting, and that's I hear that a lot when people do those kind of things. That yeah, it's you think it's just going to be a snap, and then you realize, oh no, I don't. I never realized just how embedded media is into my day-to-day -day activities. It's really, really hard. On the other hand, again, for those of you who've had the privilege of being able to travel to other countries, and uh, and a lot of times when you do that, you have to leave your cell plan behind and, and basically disconnect, and. Speaking for myself, I found that to be a very um, liberating feeling to know that I am unreachable, and even if I want it to be, and it really helps you live in the moment. So it's it's great when you're able to successfully accomplish this, but as a few of you have already pointed out, uh, easier said than done uh, to do that. It, yeah. I was just gonna say, like I've been in that same experience, but it's so strange how the advances of technology now allow us to be reachable because there's so many applications like WhatsApp, mm -hmm. where it allows you to connect and communicate with people outside of the area mm -hmm. without using yeah um, your cell phone, just using Wi-Fi. Yeah. Well, and, th and this kind of uh, slightly relates to one of the terms that I wrote on the board here that we're going to be discussing: virtual community, which basically is is you know communicating interacting with people who you're connected through through the internet as opposed to geography okay this class is on one level a community but it's a it's a physical community you're, you're geographically all in the same place but more and more people are taking part in virtual communities where you could be separated by miles by countries by oceans uh, but you, what you share typically in a virtual community is common interests. It might be a topic, uh, it might be a hobby, it could be any number of things. How many of you have, even if it's just a little bit, have partaken in a virtual community? You know, typically they have comment rooms or uh, you know ways to express opinions on the subject. And it could be you know it could be a fan site for somebody. That's a virtual community. If you like somebody's music and they have uh, a place for fans to comment on the new album or the, the concert tour or whatever, uh, that's, that's a virtual community. Anybody ever partake in this? I'm just curious. Nobody? A few of you. Okay. 
What kind of things did you do with virtual communities at YouTube? Yeah, someone passed away and was like on Facebook or something. Mm -hmm. We can all kind of communicate through it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, what are you? YouTube. 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 Mm -hmm. is a big community. Yeah. Yeah, and lots of comments on, on what you're watching there and, and people sharing their thoughts and uh, some of them not as friendly as others. But yeah, it's, it's a yeah, um, comment of uh, different things people feel about things. Were you going to say something? Okay. Uh, anybody else, uh, uh, any, if have taken part in a virtual community and, and what, have anybody ever like met, have made friends with anybody online, you know, th through um, just some weird set of circumstances? Yeah, you had your hand up. What'd you, what happened? I like made a best friend <laughs> through um, online. We um, met through mutual friends, but it was like this website called Talkbox, and uh -huh. you can like video chat with like, <coughs> up to ten people or something. Mm -hmm. And then we just got like super close to that. <laughs> we became best friends. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Did it happen to anybody else? Uh, that's kind of yeah. What happened to you? Uh, I feel like for well, at least for me, and I feel like for a lot of people. Happens through video games too. Mm -hmm. Like you'll be playing with somebody and you'll enjoy playing with them. So you'll like friend them on whatever yeah. platform you're mm -hmm. on, and then you'll just play with them consistently, and mm -hmm. then you get to be close friends. Okay. That, that's how it would be with a lot of people. Yeah, so. yeah how about you? Uh, like exchange students that come in here, mm -hmm. and like during the summer, talk to all sorts of media, so like you can be friends. Yeah. Yeah, it, we meet people from uh, different countries, and, and what have I've had that happen where I'm exploring the. Uh, topics and I and I know I or I see somebody post something that I, I find interesting and I want to explore more so I somehow track down a, you know email or or a, a website or whatever it is and make contact and I've had these conversations with people in other countries uh, that would not have been possible in, in a in a previous era which it which is uh, really interesting uh, also too it's kind of interesting this is something you wouldn't have experienced uh, necessarily yet but maybe in a few years I've I've reconnected with people from high school because of Facebook and somebody friends you and uh, you go oh my god I haven't even thought of that person for 30 years and and then and then you find out they live uh, just a uh, 30 miles away, and then we had, would end up getting together for lunch and you know, catching up, oh, what have you been doing the last 30 years? And I just thought it was so funny that this would have never happened without that media technology. We would have been uh, blissfully unaware that we were anywhere near each other's universe uh, at this point. Uh, so so that's, there's lots of social interactions, lots of other kinds of interactions that are happening just because of the kind of media technology we have. So this leads into a little bit uh, my next uh, series of terms. Uh, one is a, a media scholar by the name of Marshall McLuhan. He was a Canadian media scholar who came to prominence back in the mid-1960s. And I think some of the theories that he came up with are, are still greatly talked about today. They've been praised by some people, rubbished by others. But they, they're always worthy of a little bit of discussion. He was coming of age in terms of his theories about media at a time when television was suddenly coming into its own, where we were suddenly shifting from a world dominated by print to a world dominated by electronic media. So um, Marshall McLuhan, he, he came up with several theories and some catchphrases. And, and these next two things are catchphrases of his. One is, the medium is the message. And uh, we've actually uh, kind of talked about this a little bit in this class, even a little bit today. The medium is the message. Has anybody ever heard this phrase? Probably not, because he's been dead for a long time. The 60s was a long, long time ago. But secondly, can you even fathom the guess what McLuhan meant by this? The medium is the message. Okay, mediums meaning, you know, like television is a medium, the internet's a medium. Yeah? I mean, I've heard this before. I think he means what he means is like, it's how we shape ideals and culture, and like, you see um, this wholesome family on TV. Yeah, I, I think you're kind of close there a little bit, uh, but more specifically, 
What he was arguing was that uh, the influence, if the influence of the mass media interests us, we should focus on ways each new medium, each new medium that arrives on the scene, disrupts tradition and reshapes our social lives. Uh, in other words, what he's saying is, as we shift from a print generation to an electronic media generation, it not only uh, gives us a new way of getting the information, but, and this is what we've kind of talked about already in class, it affects our interpretation of what we're reading or, or seeing. So for instance, um, I use the 9-11 example. This is a per perfect example of how they illustrate the medium is the message. Um, if you get all your information about 9-11 through newspapers versus getting it all from television, and let's assume that the information you're getting in both cases is 100% accurate, why does it, why is your understanding of the event different using one medium over the other? Yeah? Because you can interpret it differently instead of actually getting the visual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your, you, your visuals lead to a certain interpretation. Words lead to a certain interpretation. So he's basically saying that as new mediums come along, it disrupts our interpretation <coughs> process. It, it creates new interpretation processes for us to understand the events that are going on around us. Therefore, he's saying, in some ways, the medium in which you receive the information could be as, if not more important, than the actual information content that you're receiving. And that's what he's saying that we spend a lot of time in researching media looking at content and maybe not enough time looking at how that content is delivered. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the medium is the message. And the other phrase he came up with is the global village. Basically, what he was saying about uh, the concept of the global village is that electronic media, and in, in his case, he's talking about television, because that was the most modern uh, electronic uh, medium at the time, was unifying the world in ways it never had been. The fact that we could now see what's going on in countries far, far away and, and watch events from around the world through television and then also in the 1960s through global satellite technology was, was going to actually become somewhat of a unifying factor to make us think more like a world community as opposed to national communities and thus the term the global village. There was, there was a lot of talk about this in the 60s because there, I mentioned the youth movement and music. Uh, for instance, bands like the Beatles uh, who had a worldwide appeal. No matter what country you went to, they were usually the most popular band for a while. So, so, so young people around the world were listening to the same music and seeing the same things, this whole concept of a global village. And it sounds very utopian uh, in certain ways, and if you think about it, well, how did that turn out? Are, are we living in a, a wonderfully harmonious place now thanks to electronic media? No. So, so I think in some cases McLuhan probably, in terms of explaining this concept he had of Global Village, was a probably a little too u utopian for uh, most of us in terms of uh, this creating a greater sense of global understanding and community. On the other hand, there were, there were signs that of it contributing to it. Uh, another example I can think of, uh, something I actually remember, was the first time we uh, put men on the moon. This was not just a, a television event in the United States, it was watched around the world. So again, people all joining in and sharing in the same event. But his theories somehow, I think, become even more pertinent maybe in the internet age. Uh, when you think about the internet, does the internet have more, less, or about the same potential to further this concept of a global village based on, um, based on how the medium works versus television, which was the medium of the hour when <coughs> McLuhan came up with these theories. What do you think? Does the internet change the equation at all? Does it, does it make a global <coughs> village 
more likely, and I don't mean that we're, we're going to get a utopian uh, dream realized through the internet either, because I don't think so, but uh, chat rooms alone would, would convince you otherwise. But I do think that there are certain things about it that certainly could contribute to more global understanding. What do you think about that? What, what are some aspects? I think in terms of television, and, and yeah, like television, more or less, it's kind of the same thing. Every mm -hmm. channel, every TV show, if there's going to be a conflict, and then it's going to get resolved, and mm -hmm. the world's going to be happy. But on the internet, it's more realistic. It's, it's sort of real life, but it's not as unifying as TV is. It's more diverse. It allows for more opinions. It mm -hmm. allows for more debate. I yeah. Guess. Yeah, it does, because that whole democratic process, a lot more opinions can be expressed and, and, and often more debate. What, what is another key thing that it offers that television doesn't offer? Can you think of that? Communication? Yeah, interaction. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're there. Yeah, interaction. I can say something on the Internet, uh, you know, put something on the Internet. You can respond to it. We can communicate back and forth. And we kind of were just talking about that, meeting people from other places that we don't live nearby uh, because we have the ability to communicate back and forth. Whereas television is essentially a passive activity, right? <coughs> you sit there and you watch. You, you may learn more about places and see more places around the world, but you're not interacting. The internet provides an opportunity to interact. And so therefore, it it makes it an interesting experiment to see if it does contribute, even if it's in small ways, to this concept of a global village. The fact that we can interact not just with people near us, but people from all parts of the world. So it's something, something to uh, think about. And also when you talk about technology and its effect on society, it's also interesting to look in the opposite direction. We talk about all the media saturation we have today, but what about places that don't have it or haven't traditionally have had it. And this is an interesting concept because I think our first reaction would be, well, everybody has it now, right? Well, actually, there's a few little pockets in the world where this isn't the case. Uh, one great example was, uh, or is, uh, the country of Bhutan. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Bhutan. Uh, it's a very small, <coughs> tiny country in the Himalayas uh, near China. Um, very tiny, very small population, and a kind of unusual country too, historically, in that, for instance, uh, many countries measure, for instance, their gross national product, things like that. Uh, one of the big things they measure in Bhutan, or have historically, is what they call an index of happiness. How happy are people in this country? They actually ask their citizens, are you happy, and how happy? And, and it's been discovered that historically, traditionally, people in Bhutan, even though it's a poor nation, not a lot of uh, material goods, uh, uh, but people are generally very happy there. Um, and when I say not a lot of material goods, one of the key things they did not have until 1999, okay, so only, we're only talking uh, 17 years ago. For the very first time, the country of Bhutan got this new thing called television. Think about that. At the time, most of us in the United States are in our are still at, we're in our early years of using the internet, uh, you know, on our home computers. They're getting television in 1999 for the first time. Okay. While you're most of you are infants, they're just seeing television for the first time. Um, it's, it's, does, it, there's not a lot of options available on television. You know, they're, they're certainly not getting the 200 channel package, you know, like uh, we get offered and uh, HBO Go or anything like that. They're getting very basic television, not unlike what I got as a child. But they have television. It's a, it's a great social experimentation in an era where the rest of the world is completely media saturated and here's a country that's been completely cut off from electronic media, and now they have television and they're starting to go you know, into uh, internet you know, availability too. What do you think are the possible ramifications? Again, this, is, this has only been going on for 17 years, so this is very much an experimented process. 
in progress, in process, and what is the, what is some of the <coughs> possible outcomes of this? Do you think they're all good? Do you think there could be some bad outcomes? What do you think about a country in this day and age getting television for the first time? For instance, will it drop their index of happiness when they get to see programs and find out what the rest of the world has that they don't? Yeah. Yeah, I think so because, I mean, it is entertainment, but then they'll be able to compare their lives to the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And obviously that comparison might lead to sadness. It could, couldn't it? Yeah. It could, it's definitely seems to be leading to social changes because within several years of, of um, and it, I think a lot of this has to do with this effort to modernize in that country, but they also, uh, when, the, when they first got television, the country was a monarchy. And now they're shifting away from that model toward a democracy. And I think they might still be keeping a sense of the monarchy much in the same way Great Britain has one, but not a, an actual powerful a monarchy, more figurehead type of thing, but there's been this social shift going on. Um, and so it's interesting to see this country that is so behind the times now suddenly starting to stick its toe in the media technology waters. So it, it, again, we talk about what we're going through and what they're going through <coughs> is something completely different and it will be fascinating to see what kind of effects that has on their perceptions, their worldviews, their sense of self. And also, as, as I don't know what kind of programming they have or have been, had access to, but it also kind of uh, plays into our uh, final uh, term for the day, cultural imperialism. In your reading, they're, they discuss the cultural imperialism uh, thesis. Um, we've heard the term imperialism a lot. Anybody, can anybody define just basic imperialism, the concept behind imperialism? Comes up a lot in history and uh, political science classes, for instance. Anybody familiar with that? Yeah. Manifest destiny. That would be an, an example of imperialism, yeah. And, and just to kind of more broadly define it, basically it, it's a country, you know, typically a more powerful country extending its influence or control to other countries outside its borders. Uh, the British Empire of old would be, a, would be an example of imperialism. You know, they, they, at the time when they controlled many countries around the globe, including places like India, you know, so India is obviously nothing like Great Britain, but they're being ruled by Great Britain. That's, you know, part of uh, imperialism. So, so <laughs> cultural imperialism, what do you think we're talking about there? It has nothing to do with battleships or troops or soldiers, what is cultural imperialism? Any, any guesses? None, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I think maybe it's more like, um, like for example, like uh, more like, a, like American culture being imposed on like uh, other nations that, mm -hmm. and then like changing their culture there, mm -hmm. and, like spreading um, to other yeah. parts of the world. Yeah, we talked about, for instance, we've been talking about throughout the semester the fact that we have you know, five to six media conglomerates controlling 90% of the world's media. And most of those conglomerate, conglomer, excuse me, conglomerations are uh, uh, stationed in uh, Western nations, a lot in the United States, but definitely in the West, so to speak. Okay, so producing, as you well know, a huge amount, at, at, unheard of levels compared to previous generations, a huge amount of entertainment, for instance. Think about how many movies are produced by media conglomerates you know, versus how it might have been before. And there were a lot of movies before, but now it, it's just almost overwhelming how many movies out there. You can't, even if you're a movie buff, you can't possibly see everything that comes out in the theaters because there, there's so much. I mean, a, a, clear, a key example of this is, is that it was pretty typical back in the day, you know, 
40 years ago to have most movie theaters, if they had more than one screen, it was a big deal, right? Uh, you know, three screens was considered, you were, in, you were in the most amazing place ever, they had three screens. And now, uh, you know, 14 or 15 screens is very common for a movie theater. It just shows you how much content there is. Well, that content's not just coming to us, it's going to all these countries. And so the concern becomes, are we imposing, although it may be subtle, it may be um, nuanced, but are we imposing conditions and norms that are part of our American culture, for instance, on other countries around the world just through our programming, just through our entertainment programming? First of all, do you think that's possible? Do you think if we're shipping off all these shows that are based on uh, things going on in the United States, for instance, and situations that we have here and lifestyles we have here, and then we're shipping them to all these countries in, in Asia and in various other places, does it possibly impact their culture's perception? Does it erode their own traditions? For instance, this was a huge this was a huge concern when rock and roll uh, became a big thing and went global. I mentioned that part of that youth culture of the '60s. Uh, when I say kids around the world were listening to rock and roll music, I, I wasn't just talking about Europe and the United States. I'm talking about Asia. I'm talking about places like Japan, who loved all those bands just as much as the kids in America or the kids in Britain and Germany. Okay, so. <coughs> Their people, traditional, you know, older generations in Japan were very upset by this. We don't want our young Japanese teenagers listening to this Western rock and roll music. The Soviet Union at the time actually banned rock and roll from Eastern Bloc countries, and of course that just made it more desirable, and it was a huge black market, and tons of young people were uh, smuggling in tapes and records of, of favorite Western bands because they weren't allowed to listen to it because supposedly it was a corrupting influence. But the key premise for keeping it out was it was destroying their own sense of culture in their society and imposing culture from another part of the world on them. Do you think that's valid? What do you think? Do you think countries that get a large amount of programming from this country are um, having their own sense of culture and their own sense of identity eroded? And some of you have had more chances to travel than others, so maybe you've observed <coughs> some of this and maybe you have some observations from things you've seen. So what do you, what do you think? This is a very debatable question, so there isn't really a wrong answer here, yeah. I think Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very possible. Yeah, any, any other thoughts on that in terms of other cultures and um, how, how it affects what they're doing? And, there's, and by the way, there's, there's a lot of controversy in multiple directions on this. Uh, for instance, we've had many uh, popular artists in the West go to places like Africa or Asia or South America and create music using some of the local sounds of where they go and creating a, a genre that's been kind of called world music where you you take influences from different things and and create something new uh, and some people push back against that they say you know we're 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 go basically going and stealing other people's culture and incorporating it into our own western music so do you think that's a valid complaint or, or are people getting too worried about these things? And maybe you think it's a good thing that we're merging different cultures. Maybe this is part of that global village we were talking about, that people are sharing aspects of their culture. What do you think? Everybody raise your hands at once today. Come on, it's your last chance to have a discussion in this <coughs> class other than uh, the presentations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Jack. I think if we say that like music is a form of art, then it kind of is a type of freedom yeah. of expression to combine those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. So what about um, if, if, if there's a concern, and, and, and the concerns, by the way, generally revolve around things like the fact that we're a very consumerism-driven society, that are we, where, you know, because this is something we talk about in our own society. Kids watch certain shows and say, I need one of those. I need to have that kind of clothes to be accepted. Uh, and there's concern that we're doing the same things in other countries. Maybe they're trying to wear American-style clothing or, or, yeah. Um, well, this isn't exactly like that, but mm -hmm. we talked in the discussion class about, um, I don't remember what it was, but it was like an isolated nation and once um, exposed to American programming, um, like cases of anorexia were found there. Mm. And, like That had never been seen there before. So that can, like, I think that's a pretty good example of like the harmful cultural aspects that can come from like that, that's that's a really good example. The whole concept of body image. No, that's that's a that's a great example because uh, if you're not being exposed to certain kinds of media, maybe you don't really have a sense of uh, different body images other than what you're used to. And maybe maybe if we have certain programming that's projecting, because it certainly is an issue and a problem we've talked about in this country. If, if they show that everybody who's considered successful in a particular program is, is very thin and very this and very that, then it makes people feel like they have to be that way. So yeah, why wouldn't that happen in other cultures uh, as well? There is pushback in some of these things though, and, and I would note that uh, in, in the readings, I think in chapter seven and eight, it, it kind of talks about some of this. And, and it relates to things we've talked about in this class, for instance. Like, uh, remember when we were talking about um, ideology and uh, interpretation? Do you think, for instance, I mean, I, uh, I think we've talked about this a little bit. Does your cultural background impact how you interpret something in the media? In other words, you might think, hey, that's great. What I'm watching here is great. And somebody else might say, that's, I don't like it. I think that's funny. I don't think it's funny. Do you think our cultural backgrounds influence that? Yeah, see several of you shaking your heads? Yeah, absolutely it does. So they've done studies and they've determined that it's the same thing in other countries. They may get American programming, but then what they get out of it could be completely different than um, what we uh, get out of that same programming watching it uh, here in the United States. That's one thing that they talk about in exploring that uh, in those chapters. The other thing uh, that they talk about too is that um, a lot of times, even when certain media conglomerates go to different countries, it becomes kind of like a franchise. Uh, MTV is an example. MP MTV is in a lot of different countries and a lot of parts of the world, but the way they run MTV is, it, yeah, it's owned by the bigger conglomerate, but they essentially franchise it out. So say it's the MTV India, people in India run that channel and it features music videos pertaining to India and India artists, which by the way, as many of you probably know, India has a, also has a very uh, vibrant uh, film industry. In fact, I think they make even more films in India uh, than we do in the West, you know, the whole Bollywood concept. So. So that's another thing too. Uh, countries around the world are developing their own media and, and projecting their own local identity. So that's something that's a bit of a pushback against the concerns about uh, cultural imperialism as well. But it is still a very much debated topic and something that will continue to be debated as, as we go forward. All right, so that's going to wrap up uh, the lecture portion of this semester. Hard to believe we've gotten here so fast. What I'd like to do now is uh, pass out the study guides and then just briefly go over it. Nothing majorly changed from the last exam in terms of format, but I want to give people a chance to ask some initial questions. <laughs> Yeah. And I'll get into that in a second.
Again, uh, I will also be sending a copy of this uh, to Professor Shapiro, and uh, for my section, I'll be putting it on the website if for any reason you lose your copy or something's not here today to access. picture of it and y'all got phones or yeah huh huh it, oh, it should be did, did Alexis put it on your guys Moodle or what you do last time did you, I, I sent her a copy last time if you want a picture of it come up at the end of class yeah. all right okay we'll make sure you all get one and I and I've got I can print some more copies now that I know I need a new uh, new cartridge I can change that print more if you want to stop by and get one, a hard copy as well um, so my apologies about that but uh, basically let me just go over the basics of it uh, this is uh, a study guide is covering 60 percent of the uh, test so 60 uh, percent of that exam will be things from this sheet of paper uh, in addition, 40% of it will be multiple choice, true, false. 40% multiple choice, true, false. 60% terms, 
and essay questions. All right. So what I have here is the same concept as last time. I have a list of terms. I'm going to have you answer six of the terms that are listed here. I'm going to probably put seven on the exam. You answer six. I have uh, five essay questions. I'll probably put three on the exam. You only answer two of those three that I put on the exam. Um, pretty basic. Again, same thing as last time, only no timeline. That's, that's really the only difference. If they have any questions about the format of the exam, that is one week from today, yeah. Uh, what further oh, yeah, thank you. That's a good point. It is on the study guide, but I, I also want to just verbally mention this, too. It's our required readings for this one are chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Those are the chapters of the textbook that we've been covering over these past several weeks. Okay? So that's where you'll find this information. And every single one of these terms, for instance, is in the index of the book where you have those chapters. So it should be very easy to find the information if you're a little fuzzy or if your notes uh, aren't as good as they could have been. Uh, and then the essay questions also deal with uh, a lot of things that are in the book and, and things we've discussed in class. And, and as another guide, Typically, what, what is on the exams in terms of reading assignments, I, I'm not the type of person that intentionally tries to find the most obscure fact from chapter <coughs> seven that we never talked about so I can trip you up. If I talked about it in class, it, it, that increases the likelihood that it's going to be on the exam or on the study <coughs> guide because I'm trying to highlight things that I think are most important. So if you've been paying attention, if you've been noting what I've been writing on the board, if you've been uh, trying to follow those chapter readings, it shouldn't be too tough to do very well on this exam. Also, too, it's, it's worth pointing out that you know, my office hours are uh, Mondays and uh, Monday afternoons and Tuesday mo I mean, Thursday mornings from 10 to 12. Uh, if you ever feel like, say, like Monday afternoon, there's a couple concepts you're unclear on, maybe, maybe you struggled on essay questions the last test and you want to make sure that you're more solid this time, I'm always happy to have you come by my, uh, my office hours and talk to me. I'm happy to give you feedback on any of this if anybody wants it. Okay, any other questions? Then we will see you next Thursday.